If you are a Christian, someone who has been born again of God's Spirit, then the Bible declares you a gifted person. How oh, so? Well, to start with, you have been gifted the faith to believe in Jesus as your Saviour and Lord. This is what Paul makes clear in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved, he says, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. And then Paul goes on to say that God has lined up good works in advance for you to do, not just individually, but for us as a church as well. We are God's handiwork, he says, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And in addition to this gift of saving faith, God enables us, his people, to do those good works by giving us specific gifts that we would not otherwise have. And with that comes the specific gift of faith to exercise them. Introducing the subject in Romans 12 of how God gifts different people differently, Paul says this. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and those members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. In order then to fulfill the great commandment, love God and love others, you and I have been variously gifted to enable us in love to serve God and others, whether through worship gifts, gifts that enable us to worship God, fellowship gifts, mission gifts, or gifts that serve all three together. We're looking at how Paul was shaped by God for his ministry. Remember that shape stands for spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experience. My understanding of spiritual gifts are that they are special abilities that a person would not otherwise possess. They may even extend to a calling upon someone to exercise a gift so it almost becomes a way of life. And the latter is certainly the case when we come to consider Paul as an apostle. Now, what qualified Paul? As an apostle. At the end of Acts chapter 1, Peter sets out the necessary conditions. The traitor, Judas Iscariot, needed to be replaced. Luke tells us what happened. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. This is Peter speaking. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the eleven apostles. Now, of course, this was before Saul of Tarsus had even been converted. So how does he qualify to be an apostle? Well, speaking about the resurrection of Jesus and his appearances to his disciples, Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. Then he appeared to James then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, 
I am what I am. Now, in this sense, thinking of the apostles, there are no more apostles like them, but they remain gifts to the church through their writings. The New Testament, through which they speak with apostolic authority to this very day. But having said that, did you know that you too could be called an apostle, albeit with a small a, not a capital A? Right, let me take you on a journey with this word apostle. In the New Testament, the word apostle is what I call an onion word, not because of its smell, but because of its layers. It's layers of meaning, layers that are hidden or camouflaged beneath our English translations. Firstly, there's Jesus himself. Did you know that Jesus was an apostle? In John's Gospel, Jesus repeatedly refers to himself as the one who has been sent by his Father. And the word translated sent there is the Greek word apostled. He has been apostled by his Father. Now, I'm not going to quote all the verses in John's Gospel because that would take a bit of time and might even be a little tedious. But here are a couple of examples. First of all, from John 3, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world, in other words, for God did not apostle his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And in John 17 and verse 3, Jesus himself in his prayer. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus Christ, whom you have apostled. And then to cap it all this, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your, th your thoughts on Jesus, whom we profess as our apostle and high priest. I've noticed that some English translations omit this reference to Jesus as an apostle altogether, while others choose the translation messenger with a capital M or emissary, capital E. It's a reference to the fact that the author of Hebrews sees Jesus as the apostle of God, the one through whom, in the light of Hebrews 1 and verse 1, God has finally and fully spoken. No one and nothing else comes close. Let me quote to you from Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, in brackets, his apostle, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son, his apostle, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Jesus is the apostle sent from heaven, and therefore we can consider him to be the head, spring or source of all subsequent apostleship. So that's layers one and two, Jesus and then the twelve apostles. Next, there's the apostles of the churches, layer three. Philippians 2 and verse 25, Paul refers to Epaphroditus. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, who is also your apostle, whom you sent to take care of my needs. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 23, as for Titus, he is my partner and co-worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives. They are apostles of the churches and an honor to Christ. Paul and Barnabas were commissioned on their mission journeys by the church in Antioch. In Acts 13 and verse 2, Luke tells us that while they, the church, were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And it is in that respect that Barnabas, alongside Paul, was called an apostle when in Lystra. Acts 14 and verse 14. 
But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they were about to be worshipped as gods because of a miracle that Paul had uh, performed, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, well, stop, basically. And then in Romans chapter 16 and verse 7, we read this. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. It seems that Paul was both a layer two apostle, an apostle with a capital A, and a layer three apostle, an apostle of the church in Antioch. And churches today send specific people out to fulfill a particular task or calling. Those who church planted World Baptist Church out of Milton were, if you like, apostled by Milton Baptist Church. And World Baptist Church is Peter and Louise Lynch's sending church. In New Testament speak, we are their apostling church. And they, through the auspices of BMS World Mission, are our apostles in Bangladesh. And, along with other churches, we've adopted Judy Cook as an apostle of the churches in Thailand. So, although the gift of layer two apostle, apostle with a capital A, was unique to the New Testament church, the ripple effect of apostolic ministry continues into the present. Which brings me to uh, my final layer of this onion word. We all have an apostolic calling and gifting. Back to John 17, verse 18. Jesus says this, As you sent, as you apostled me into the world, I have sent, I have apostled them into the world. John 20, verse 21. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. A change of analogy from onions to dominoes. Think of the word apostle as a word with a domino or cascade effect, or a ripple effect if you prefer. The father commissioned and sent his apostle son. One further reference, 1 John 4 and verse 10. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and apostled his son and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus, the Apostle, then apostled the Twelve and Paul, and through their preaching of the Apostolic Gospel, churches were established which then called and commissioned others and sent them off on various tasks, apostled them around the Roman world. This, I would suggest, is the true apostolic succession, which comes down to you and to me today. Whatever mine and yours spiritual gifts might be, they are given so that we can serve the apostolic purpose of the church. And we are called to dedicate all we are and have to the one and only apostle and high priest, Jesus Christ our Lord. So as we consider the gifts of God's Spirit, let us consider the fact that God is shaping World Baptist Church as an apostolic community, which is his gift to the community and which is for the eternal good of the community. So, when we read that the risen Lord gifted his church with apostles, let's not be too quick to dismiss it as just for then in the first century. The domino effect of that gift continues to this day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus, the Apostle and High Priest of our faith and confession. Thank you for those whom you called to be your Apostles in the first century, whom you used to build your church. We thank you that we have their writings to this very day. We thank you for those whom you continue to send through your church out into the world to make Jesus known. And Lord, fill us with your spirit 
that we might be true to our apostolic calling and gifting as a church in the 21st century. Faithfully and powerfully will you equip us to make Jesus known, we pray. For the glory of your matchless name. Amen. Amen. Till the next time. Bye for now.